Today I'm going to be back in chapter two, but talking about Joseph Smith's first vision. In last week's video, we covered the part of chapter two that was about Joseph Smith's treasure digging. Today, I'm going to talk about the part of chapter two that's about the first vision. First, I'm going to read a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley. He was a prophet of the church before the one that was before the one right now. <laughs> he said, our whole strength rests on the validity of that first vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. If it did, then it is the most important and wonderful work under the heavens. Recently, in May of this year, M. Russell Ballard, who is one of the 12 apostles of the church right now, was in Toronto, Ontario, addressing some missionaries for the church. He bore his testimony about Joseph Smith and said, the most remarkable thing in the history of the world happened in the sacred grove in 1820. That, that upset me, even though I'm not a member anymore, because how can any religious person say that Joseph Smith getting the first vision was more important than Jesus Christ? I can't understand that or anyone could listen to that and be okay with it. But it shows how important the first vision is to the LDS church and its claims. Fawn Brody begins the account of his first vision. She writes, when he was 14 years old, he wrote he was troubled by religious revivals in the neighborhood and went into the woods to seek guidance of the Lord. She has a section of the longer vision, but I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The main points she makes in this, in this part of the chapter are that he was troubled by the revivals going on in the neighborhood, that he went into the woods to seek guidance, and that he was 14 years old. All of my years in the Mormon church, I was taught that this was an unprecedented thing. This is something that hadn't happened to anyone else. It is a one of a kind experience, at least in modern times. But is that true? On page 22, she says, lesser visions than this were common in the folklore of the area. Elias Smith, Vermont's famous dissenting preacher at the age of 16, had had a strikingly similar experience in the woods near Woodstock when he saw the lamb upon Mount Zion and a bright glory in the forest. John Samuel Thompson, who taught in the Palmyra Academy in 1825, had seen Christ descend from the firmament in a glare of brightness exceeding tenfold the brilliancy of the meridian sun, and had heard him say, I commission you to go and tell mankind that I am come and bid every man to shout victory. But Thompson had never said that it was anything more than a dream. She also mentions Asa, Asa Wilde's first vision account. Asa Wilde on October 1823 said, it seemed as if my mind was struck motionless as well as into nothing before the awful and glorious majesty of the great Jehovah. He then spake. He told me that every denomination of professing Christians had become extremely corrupt. There's also an 1815 account by Norris Stearns. He, re he says, at length, as I lay apparently upon the brink of eternal woe, Seeing nothing but death before me, suddenly there came a sweet flow of the love of God to my soul, which gradually increased. At the same time, there appeared a small gleam of light in the room above the brightness of the sun. Then at his meridian, which grew brighter and brighter, at length being in ecstasy of joy, I turned to the other side of the bed, whether in the body or not, I cannot tell. God knoweth. There I saw two spirits, which I knew at first sight. But if I had the tongue of an angel, I could not describe their glory, for they brought the joys of heaven with them. One was God, my maker almost in bodily shape like a man. His face was, as it were, a flame of fire, and his body as it had been a pillar and a cloud. In looking steadfastly to discern features, could see none, but a small glimpse would appear in some other place. Below him stood Jesus Christ, my Redeemer, in perfect shape like a man. His face was not ablaze, but had the countenance of fire, being bright and shining. His Father's will appeared to be his. All was condensation, peace, and love. There's also a visionary experience from Solomon Chamberlain, where he says, dissatisfied with the religions he had tried, Chamberlain prayed for further guidance, and in 1816, according to his account, the Lord revealed to me in a vision of night an angel. When Chamberlain asked about the right way, the angel told him that the churches were corrupt and that God would soon raise up a church. All of these accounts are very similar to Joseph Smith's, and there are many more. These are just a handful. The funny thing about these accounts is also that they were well known. They were published in newspapers and journals in that time as if it were perfectly normal and acceptable. What about the revivals? We need to talk about that for a minute. In his account, he is going to talk about how there were so many revivals going on in his area, and that was what got him thinking as a young boy about the churches and which one was true. Hugh Nibley, who I've mentioned before, he's the one that wrote the response to Von Brody's book, said that there were several accounts of these revivals in the Palmyra area in 1820, as Joseph Smith has said that they were. In the Saints books, which I mentioned last week, on page 12, it says, while attending a sermon, Joseph heard a minister quote from the first chapter of James in the New Testament. 
If any of you lack wisdom, he said, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And we're told that it was that minister giving that speech that led Joseph Smith to think, oh, I can pray and I can pray and get my answers. However, there were no spiritual revivals in Palmyra in 1820. There were revivals nearby in 1816 and 17 and in the 1821, but they were nowhere near Palmyra. The only one that there is on record for being in Palmyra was in 1824. And the minister, Reverend Lane, who is the one that supposedly read from James in the Bible and inspired Joseph Smith, his church has made it clear in their records that he was nowhere near Palmyra until 1824. Even B.H. Roberts, who was a church historian, has had admitted that. The official LDS essay on their website says this, Documentary evidence, however, supports Joseph Smith's statements regarding the revivals happening in 1820. The region where he lived became famous for its religious fervor and was unquestionably one of the hotbeds of religious revivals. Historians refer to the region as the burned over district because preachers wore out the land holding camp revivals and seeking converts during the early 1800s. So they are taking the same line that Nibley did, but there's so many accounts saying this. But even Fair Mormon, who are the modern apologists right now, respond to a lot of the criti criticisms toward the LDS church have said, yes, they're correct. There was no revival in that year. So why wouldn't they change it? If they change the revival, if they change the first vision to being 1824, that messes up Joseph Smith's entire timeline. But when you realize there were no revivals going on in Palmyra and that that, me that minister that I've heard the story of hundreds of times wasn't anywhere near there, it makes you start to question, well, why is that story included in the narrative we get for the first vision? And we are going to go back to that in a minute. On page 23, Fawn Brody says, one would naturally expect the local press to have given this first vision considerable publicity at the time it allegedly occurred. And Joseph's autobiography would indeed lead one to believe that his vision of God the Father and his son had created a neighborhood sensation. He said, I soon found, however, that my telling of the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against me among professors of religion and was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase. And though I was an obscure boy only between 14 and 15 years of age and my circumstances in life such as to make a boy of no consequence in the world, yet men of high standing would take notice sufficient to excite the public mind against me and create a bitter persecution and this was common to all the sects, all united to persecute me. Oddly, however, the Palmyra newspapers, which in later years gave him plenty of unpleasant publicity, they took no notice of Joseph's vision at the time it was supposed to have occurred. So when I read that, I thought that, that there's no way that can be true. All I've heard about for as long as I can remember is how persecuted he was for this first vision. But was he? A former assistant church historian of the LDS church, James B. Allen, confirms that the first vision was not well known. He says this, There is little, if any, evidence, however, that by the early 1830s, Joseph Smith was telling the story in public. At least, if he were telling it, no one seemed to consider it important enough to have recorded it at the time, and no one was criticizing him for it. Not even in his own history did Joseph Smith mention being criticized in this period for telling the story of the first vision. The fact that none of the available contemporary writings about Joseph Smith in the 1830s None of the publications of the church in that decade and no contemporary journal or correspondence yet discovered mentions the story of the first vision it is convincing that at best it received only limited circulation in the early days. And that goes along with me reading those first vision accounts from other people a few minutes ago. Those were all printed in newspapers and books of the time. Why would his have been singled out? He also writes on page 23, it is well known that Joe Smith never pretended to have any communion with angels until a long period after the pretended finding of his book. That was a quote from Obadiah Dogberry in the Palmyra Reflector. And that is what I found in my studies as I was looking up all of these things. I found that even among his family and his closest friends, the people that were positive about the church, church members, there is no record found that mentions the first vision at all until at least 12 years later. On page 24, she starts talking about the first vision accounts. And I said accounts, yes. She said, Joseph first published, Joseph's first published autobiographical sketch of 1834 already noted contained no whisper of an event that if it had happened would have been the most soul shattering experience of his whole youth. But there are two manuscript versions of the vision between 1831 and the published account in Orson Pratt's Remarkable Visions in 1840 
which indicate that it underwent a remarkable evolution in detail. I want to touch on that for a minute. She goes into a little bit more detail there, but I'm going to actually read them. There are four main accounts of the first vision and many secondary accounts. I'm only going to really talk about the four main accounts. The first account in 1832 is the only one handwritten by Joseph himself. It was written in his journals. This will take, this will take a few minutes. You might want to speed it up as I read. But this account, you'll notice there is no mention of two beings. This is 12 years after the fact. There's no reference about what church to join. No description of being attacked by Satan. And that will make sense in a minute. And it says that he knew that there was no church he wanted to join before he went to pray. So in this account, he says that at the, about the age of 12 years, his mind became impressed with regard to concerns for his immortal soul. He says, I found that mankind did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith and that there was no society or denomination that was built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. So he already knew that none of the churches were right, according to the first one in his journal, handwritten by him. So then he says, I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord in the, in the 16th year of my age, which means he would have been 15, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me. I was filled with the Spirit of God, and the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. And he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth to visit them according to their ungodliness and to bring to pass that which has been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles. Behold and lo, I come quickly as it is written of me in the clouds, clothed in the glory of my father. My soul was filled with love and for many days I could rejoice with great joy. The Lord was with me, but I could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart. So again, already knew he didn't want to join any churches, 15 years old, and it was just Jesus Christ. The next account comes in 1835. It was recounted to Robert Matthews, who was visiting Kirtland, Ohio, and recorded in Joseph Smith's journal by his scribe, Warren Parrish. He starts out saying, I knew not who was right or who was wrong. Being thus perplexed in mind, I retired to the silent grove and bowed down before the Lord under a realizing sense that he had said, if the Bible be true, ask and ye shall receive, knock, and it shall be opened, seek and ye shall find, and again, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. And so then he, he goes on, there's a couple, I don't want to read every, I don't want to read every word, so I'll just go on to when he talks about the actual vision. He said, I I made a fruitless attempt to pray. My tongue seemed to be swollen in my mouth, so I could not utter. I heard a noise behind me like some person walking towards me. I strove again to pray, but could not. The noise of walking seemed to draw near. I sprung up to my feet and looked around, but no, saw no person or thing that was calculated to produce the noise of walking. I kneeled again. My mouth was opened and my tongue liberated, and I called on the Lord in mighty prayer. A pillar of fire appeared above my head. It presently rested down upon me and filled me with joy unspeakable. A personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame, which was spread all around, and yet nothing consumed. Another personage soon appeared, like unto the first. He said unto me, Thy sins are forgiven thee. He testified unto me that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I saw many angels in this vision. I I was about 14 years old when I received this first communication. So this has the pillar of light or fire. Um, It has two beings in it, but one appears and then another. And then it has a bunch of angels. The next account in 1838 is the official version of the first vision. It was first published in the Times and Season, which is a church newspaper in Nauvoo, Illinois, in 1842, and was part of a longer history dictated by Joseph Smith. So I won't go into the whole history, but he says in this that he was, in at the time, he was in his 15th year, meaning 14 years old. And he says in this, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given them. This surprised me that this was the official version because I'd always heard it was a minister that said it to him. But in the official version, it says he was reading the scriptures. And I somehow had missed that before. He says, I retired to the woods to make the attempt. It was on the morning of a beautiful clear day, early in the spring of 1820. I had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally, he says. Then he says, having looked around me and finding myself alone, 
I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. But exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at that very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from an unseen world, who had such marvelous power as I'd never before felt in any being, just at this moment of great alarm I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. My ob object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. No sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak, that I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which all the sects was right, for at this time I had never entered into my heart that all were wrong, in which I should join. That's an important point because we know that in an early account he did say that he had already thought of that. And in last week's video, I talked about how his parents had always felt that way. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they drew near to me, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He again forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. When I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back, looking up into heaven. When the light had departed... I had no strength, but soon recovering in some degree, I went home. As I, leaned, as I leaned up to the fireplace, mother inquired what the matter was. I replied, never mind, all is well, I am well enough off. I then said to my mother, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. It seems as though the adversary was aware at a very early period of my life that I was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of his kingdom. Else why should the powers of darkness combine against me? Why the opposition and persecution that arose against me almost in my infancy? And he goes on to talk about how he told a minister and the minister told him that his vision was from the devil and that all united to persecute him. So in that one, we get God and Jesus. We don't get the sins being forgiven. We, we get only the churches and we don't get the angels. The fourth one is called the Wentworth letter. It was in March of 1842. It was written in response to the editor of the Chicago Democrat paper and so it was written to people that wouldn't know very much about the LDS church. The guy was asking for information about the church. So he said, when about 14 years of age, I began to reflect upon the importance of being prepared for a future state. And upon inquiring about the plan of salvation, I found that there was a great clash in religious sentiment. If I went to one society, they referred me to one plan and to another, to another, each one pointing to his own particular creed as the summum bonum of perfection. Considering that all could not be right and that God could not be the author of so much confusion, I determined to investigate the subject more fully believing that if God had a church, it would not be split up into factions, and that if he taught one society to worship one way and administer in one set of ordinances, he would not teach in other principles which were diametrically opposed. Believing the word of God, I had confidence in the declaration of James. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. I retired to a secret place in a grove and began to call upon the Lord, while fervently engaged in supplication. My mind was taken away from the objects with which I was surrounded, and I was enwrapped in a heavenly vision and saw two glorious personages who exactly resembled each other in features and likeness. Surrounded with a brilliant light which eclipsed the sun at noonday, they told me that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom, and I was expressly commanded to go not after them, at the same time receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me. That one's the most like the real, the official one. An interesting thing is a lot of the secondary accounts also differ in who was there and what was said. And even some people, including his brother William, said it was an angel, not even God or Jesus. So there is a lot of contradiction between all of the accounts. In the Gospel Topics essay, it says two unpublished journal accounts were generally forgotten until church historians rediscovered and published them. That's not true. The Tanners, Gerald and Sandra Tanner that I've quoted from in other videos, they wrote in their book about how the church always said that there was only one account and that Preston Nibley declared, Joseph Smith lived a little more than 24 years after his first vision and during that time he told only one story. At the very time that Preston Nibley made this statement, the Mormon leaders were suppressing at least two accounts of the first vision which were written prior to the account which Joseph Smith published in the Times and Seasons. 
Levi Edgar Young, who was the head of the seven presidents of the 70s in the Mormon church, told Lamar Peterson that he had examined a strange account of the first vision and was told not to reveal what it contained. So the Tanners read that and they went to the church historian, Joseph Fielding Smith, and they had asked him to see this strange account and they were trying to find out what it was talking about and they were given no information, told it didn't exist. So they knew about it before the church historians found it. And in fact, there is evidence that Joseph Fielding Smith ripped it out of Joseph's journal, the first one out of Joseph's journal and later taped it back in when they decided to reveal that they existed. Another interesting thing that happened to them during that time is when they were saying that they had proof that there were uh, first vision accounts before the official one, but that there was no information about the first vision before a certain time. The Apostle Legrand Richards claimed that his grandfather, Joseph Lee Robinson, wrote concerning the first vision before Joseph Smith published his account. So he said, My great-grandfather's diary indicated the prophet Joseph had seen the father and son, and this was written back in 1840. So he says it's not too much later than the 1820 vision. However, Legrand Richards instructed the genealogical library not to allow the Tanners to see this journal, but sometime later, contrary to his instructions, they were permitted to read it and they found that it was not written until 1883. So there was a lot of suppression of First Vision accounts going on. I find this very important because the church website says that their historians found these two unpublished versions and put them out. They also say that they published them widely in the church magazines. Well, if that were the case, how come I'd never heard about it until a few years ago? I would say that most people until the last few years did not know that there were differing versions of the First Vision and some people nowadays would know that they've heard things that maybe there are, but they have no idea. They've never seen them in a church magazine or church publication. They haven't gone to the website and seen them. The four visions that I read, I printed off of the church website from their Gospel Topics essay. However, if you go there and you want to read the Gospel Topics essay about the first vision, it has the whole essay without the first visions in it, then it has hyperlinks that go to each one. But but going back to the saints book again, where most of the LDS people now are going to get their story, this is how the first vision account is written in that book. It says he was 14. It was a spring morning in 1820. He went to the woods, made sure he was alone, knelt and prayed, asked for mercy and forgiveness and wisdom. He said, oh Lord, what church should I join? His tongue swelled. He was unable to speak. He heard footsteps, but no one was there. They grew louder. He jumped up and turned around, but no one was there still. But then a unseen power seized him. He couldn't speak. There was a thick darkness that closed in around him. He could no longer see the sunlight. He had doubts and awful images in his mind. He felt like a terrible being wanted to destroy him. He was exhorting all of his strength to call out to God. His tongue was loosened and he pleaded for deliverance. He sunk deeper into despair, overwhelmed by the darkness. And then a pillar of light appeared over his head and seemed to set the woods on fire. The light rested on him and the unseen power finally let go. The Spirit of God took its place and filled him with peace and joy. So he saw God above him, his face brighter than the sun. He called him by name and pointed to another being who appeared beside him. This is my beloved son, hear him. Jesus tells him his sins are forgiven. The burden is lifted. What church should I join? He asked. And Jesus says, none. They teach doctrines for the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He said the world was seeped in sin steeped in sin that none doeth good he told them they turned aside from the gospel and sacred truths had been lost or corrupted he promised to reveal the full truth in the future as jesus spoke joseph saw hosts of angels jesus said he would come quickly when the light faded joseph was lying on his back looking up in the saints book they took all four of those accounts that contradicted each other and they've put them all into one story so that the story that most people are going to be reading now has the elements of all four accounts. It has God and Jesus, but also the angels. It has the tongue loosening. The only thing that it doesn't have is 15 years of age because there was the one that was later. I believe that they have done that so that when people read the saints, when they then encounter the contradictory first vision accounts from the official account I grew up with, it won't seem weird to them. They'll already know the information and they'll be like, oh yeah, that, that I already knew that. In the Gospel Topics essay, they also compare these differing accounts to the differing accounts in the Gospels. I understand why they're doing that, but it's, it, it's not the same thing. Joseph Smith was telling his accounts of something that happened to him. And the Gospels are different people saying something different. 
if my family, if all four of us went and did an activity, we would all probably bring up different points of the activity. We would talk about the things that were the most important to us, the things that stood out the most. So four people's account of one event can be vastly different or can have things that are the same with different details. An example of this is when I was talking a couple of videos ago about my journals when I was in high school and how if I tried to write those things now, I wouldn't have all the details correct. But my husband and I talked about this when I first found out about all these First Vision accounts. And I said, you know, I could understand the details a little bit. I could understand him forgetting certain things he said, but I don't think that anyone could see God and Jesus Christ in person and forget who was there and what they said. I really don't. Some other problems I encountered when studying the First Vision are that if you think back to the video I made last week, the timeline then makes it so that this first vision account happened in 1820. Well, in 1822 is when he found the seer stone and started treasure digging. And in 1826 is when he was on trial. So it was after having already seen Jesus Christ and God that he did all of those things that we talked about in last week's video. The second problem is that in the year 1832, Joseph Smith claimed to have a revelation in which he stated that man could not see God unless he had the priesthood. This is in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and it reads, Without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. I remember that was something that bothered me because I was like, wait, the Bible says you can't see the face of God and live. But this revelation kind of brings that back up like, well, we can if we have the priesthood. But he didn't have the priesthood yet. His family also continued going to the church that they belonged to after he had his first vision, which makes you wonder if they were just like, well, okay, but until you start a church, we'll go here. Or did they not know about his answer? There's also evidence that Joseph Smith took steps to become a Methodist in 1828. He's on records for the Methodist church going through the steps that they required to become a member of their church. All of these things, they really called into question when I was reading this the first time of whether this ever happened. On page 25, Von Brody says, if something happened that spring morning in 1820, it passed totally unnoticed in Joseph's hometown and apparently did not even fix itself in the minds of members of his own family. Through the reading of these First Vision accounts and finding out how they were hidden for so long, like most things that the LDS Church has denied for a long time or hidden, they are still giving you this watered down version that doesn't give you the truth. They tell you enough of the story to make you think that you know what is true and what is problematic, but they still leave out so much of it. And I love that Fawn Brody at the time, like we talked, like I talked about in the first video, she didn't have the internet. She was able to find all these records and let us know about these things when they were still being hidden. And I think it's crazy how much she has been vilified. I've shown you in the last three videos, but especially these last two, how many things that she brought up in her book that she is directly attacked for and, and people in the church said weren't true and now we have found out they are. I just don't, I just don't know how they can keep up this narrative for very much longer. So if you didn't know this, if you did know this, let me know what you think. What are your thoughts on this first, on the first vision and on the different versions of it? And did it surprise you that there were different versions of it? In the next video, we'll finally get into chapter three.